by looking for a consistent biblical position from which you might witness against the disgrace all around us. As many of us have found, you'll lose your job within the seminary community. You'll lose your standing in the church establishment. You'll virtually become unemployable, even if you're orthodox. You'll become ostracized. You'll be called dangerous. What's wrong with us? That theonomists are dangerous when we have to lock our windows at night? It's crazy, isn't it? How many times can a man turn his head and pretend he just doesn't see? Of all the wicked heresies and threatening movements facing the church in our day, when Westminster Seminary finally organized their faculty to write something in unison, they gave their determined political efforts not to fight socialism, not to fight homosexuality, not abortion, not crime and mayhem in our society, not subjectivism and theology, not dispensationalism, not cultural relativism, not licentiousness, not defection from the New Testament, not defection from the Westminster Confession of Faith, all of which are out there and they could give their legitimate efforts to. Boy, the thing they had to write about was theonomy. How many times can a man turn his head and pretend he doesn't see? We are living in the cesspool of relativism, and the church doesn't have an answer. Well, I praise God, not for my work. I think it's the grace of God that allows me to have this ministry. But I praise God that the truth that the early church knew, and that is found in the Bible, is available to us, and there are people like you who are willing to say, we'll pay the price. It's worth it. Four this morning. Deuteronomy chapter 4. When you get there, we're going to look this morning and read starting out verses 6 through 8. Give everyone just a few more seconds to get there. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. This is the living and the holy word of God. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, who when they hear all these statutes will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon Him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you Today, upon the reading of God's word this morning, let's pray. Lord God, I thank you so much for your word. God, I thank you for all that you continue to do through us, God, and in us. Lord, I thank you for the people that are here this morning, God. God, that are here to worship, Lord. God, that are here to learn more about your word, Lord. God, and I just pray this morning, as uh, Colin has already beautifully said, Lord, just to um, speak through me, God, in a mighty way, Lord. Help it to be your words, Lord. God, please guard my lips from error and help me to be able to say whatever it is that you would like me to be able to say, say this morning. God, help me to be consistent with Scripture, God, not only in speaking, God, but also in action as a minister of your word. Thank you for this beautiful day that you have given us, God. Thank you for the weather that you've given us, Lord. God, we ask this morning and pray that you be with all those victims, God, victims, God, that were uh, taken this week during the tornado, God, whether it be in Tennessee or Kentucky or another state. Lord, be with their families, God. Be with um, just all that knew them, friends. And Lord, uh, God, I just ask that you also raise up the church and, and, and call us, God, and, and the people around these areas, God, to be able to, to help with uh, this devastation, Lord. Just be with them, please. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're wondering why I played that clip, um, that was from Dr. Greg Bonson, a Presbyterian minister and theologian and apologist and scholar, and he's got many titles to his name. But we've been in this subject for a couple weeks now, dealing with the law of God and how to properly understand the law of God, and we've, we've, we've talked about a lot so far. And so um, there's a lot to take in with, with everything that's happening. But 
what Dr. Bonson was really getting at was when he came out with his book, um, Theonomy and Christian Ethics, back in the 70s, and I didn't realize this till this week, he was uh, really, when he started the very process of writing this book, he's in his early 20s. And the things that he writes, I don't know many 70-year-olds, 80-year-olds, 90-year-olds, anyone that is in their even prime in their, their 50s when it comes to theology and their, their understanding that could write at the level that he wrote in his mid-20s. It is quite amazing what God did through him. But here's what he's saying. There was a time when he is going around and he is a professor at so many of these seminaries and um, he had a PhD. He had many, um, many um, different degrees when it came to things in theological studies, things outside of theological studies and philosophy. And what happened was is there came to a point where he actually got dismissed from the very seminary community because of what he believed God's law was. That it was binding in the sense of not ceremonial law, but it was our standard for objective morality. It was our standard of how to punish the evildoer. And the church drastically got away from that so much that we don't even have it a standard of evil. And so what he says is, when the Westminster Seminary came together in unison as a faculty to write anything that they could have wrote, anything, they could have wrote about homosexuality, they could have wrote about abortion, they could have wrote about how we tackle these different subjects, they rose up in unison against God's law and the understanding of God's law that was pressing on that society in that day. Because people are sitting back going, we have no standard of justice. It's just what we want to do. It's what the church wants. We have no standard for morality. Everything is just relevant. It's just what you want to do, what I want to do. And he says they could have wrote about anything, but instead they wanted to go ahead and just pin it against theonomy, pin it against God's law, and basically continue to try um, not to raise up godly leaders within that community, but continue with moral relativism and an um, autonomous nature, if you will, when it came to how we view social change and justice and all these different things with morality. So it's quite, a, it's quite a powerful thing that he says right there that there are people that are going to be willing to pay the price. There's going to be people that are willing to stand on sola scriptura and say this is what has to be done. And guys, uh, it's, not to, uh, it's not to hype you up or to over-spiritualize it, but we are those people. Um, there, there is something that has been left off for many years now when it comes to evangelism, when it comes to understanding the scripture. And um, people knew that it, a re reformation would happen one day and come again. And um, I believe that is coming in a strong force. But uh, it's just to say we want to be faithful in understanding the entirety word of God. So that's what he's getting at essentially when he, uh, what you just heard. Now, if you're curious um, about many of the things that we have talked about um, we would have to have a lot of one-on-one -on -one time and stuff to be able to get into much of God's uh, law if you've missed a Sunday or whatnot or you're new to this and stuff. And we could definitely do that one day, but we're going to leave off kind of where we left off last week. But there's a few things I want us to understand and question before I start this morning. The main thing that we are questioning here as a church and that we want to be challenged by, if, if not God's law, then what law? If not God's word, then what do we go to as our ultimate standard, as our authority? Is it based on us? Is it based on just what the church says? Is it based on what culture says? If not God's law, then what law? I hope through our theonomic study thus far, you have been persuaded of five key points that I jotted down this week. Point number one, I hope that you have been persuaded and will be persuaded after today that when the law is applied lawfully, it is always spoken of in a positive light. When it's applied lawfully, we will get into that subject more today. Number two, I hope that you have been, been persuaded that Jesus endorses the entirety of the law and the prophets. And yes, even in the gospel, he endorses the, um, the civil penalty for sin and crime, which we would call, um, basically, it's just his standard of justice whenever it comes to... Um, to crime and, and, and sin, the penal sanctions. Number three, I hope that you have been persuaded that the New Testament writers 
also endorsed the law of God and they applied the general equity of the law when necessary. You have Paul saying many things. You have him saying in Romans 3, after he talks about justification and the very nature of man, he sits back and he says things like, listen, do we do away with the law now because of God's graciousness? He says, by no means. It means God forbid, don't say that. But he says, instead, we uphold the law and we establish it. You have also him saying things like in the, um, the book of Acts, whenever they're, they're challenging him before the council and stuff, these pagan councils before the Romans, and he says things like this, if there's anything that I have been found worthy to die of, he goes, well, by all means, go ahead and execute me, do it. Because what standard is he abiding by? God's very standard of justice. Then he goes on in Romans 13 to talk about the evildoer of how our very um, system that should be set up today but is not but was in that time is to punish the evildoer by what standard? Well, by God's standard. And it's quite heinous today when we look at any other standard and we look at a, a man that rapes a child and then beheads that child or a woman and then kills that woman or just the very rape itself or some atrocity when it comes to our culture. And we say, we want to implement a different standard of justice, different from God's law because we like it or because we think it's better or we think that they will learn a better case from it. What we're doing in those, in those instances is we're looking at God's law and we are saying those laws in which you gave are unjust. They're not right. There's a big problem with that is because God has already called his law just, holy, and righteous all through the Old Testament and the New Testament. We'll continue to see that today. We have no way to say it's not binding today. Number four, I hope that I've persuaded you this far that only God has the authority according to his law to tell us what is and is what is not morally binding. Only God does. No human, no pastor, no priest, no minister, no matter what denomination someone resides in, only God has the authority to tell us what is and what is not binding today. And of course, the New Testament has done that. Many times it's easy for us to look when we say God's law is binding and people go, well, Kyle, you know, you need to sacrifice. You know, you need to do sacrifices today and you need to, you need to ordain a priest and all these things. And usually my reply back to that is if you really understood God's law, those questions wouldn't even come out. Those statements wouldn't even come out. If you really properly understood the New Testament, you would realize that God in His revelation in the New Testament has done away with those ceremonies, has done away that we have a priest, we have a king, we have the sacrifice, and that's in Jesus Christ. There is none that is greater but Him. It's only Him and Him alone. And point number five, and this is the biggest one that I think humbles me every single day, no matter how many hours I put into this study of God's law, is I hope I have persuaded you through the last three weeks that there is, no, there is so much work left to be done in the study of understanding God's law and applying God's law even on our culture today. There's a man by the name of Gary North that I've known about him for a very long time, but some things sparked me this week to do a little bit more study on him. And he says something that's quite brilliant. He says, you know, people aren't going to understand the law of God as long as we have antinomians within the church. As long as we have people saying, nope, we'll just live by our own, our own standard or whatever we feel the Spirit prompting us to do as if the Spirit of God contradicts His very Word and what He has revealed to us in history. And what he did was is we need faithful men like Gary North that are willing to take one chapter of the Bible and spend three to five years exegeting one chapter in order that the culture and the church and society would properly understand things like Exodus 20 or some part in Leviticus. And Gary North was one of those men that actually, he's still alive today, he lives in Georgia, but um, he's one of those men that faithfully did that, writing thousands and thousands of pages just on one to two verses. It's quite, it's quite amazing and stuff. So and all that to say, there's a lot of work to be done. And as I tell you guys every single week, um, the more I study this subject, the more I realize I do not know about the Bible and stuff. And it is more of a shame on me and shame on us as a church and our upbringing. And we need to get back to those solid foundations of understanding the Word of God. Now this morning, how we left off last week is I listed many of the things that Paul, John, James, 
And maybe I went into 1 Peter. I don't remember if I did or not. Probably not. But I list many different people in the New Testament, these New Testament writers. We ever already covered Jesus. We talked about what he says about the law of God. Last week I talked about the New Testament writers and what they say about the law of God. And you see all this positivity. You see the endorsement of the law. You see the binding of the law when it comes to this. But the challenge that usually goes out is, well, Kyle, there's many, yes, positive passages. And yes, you have Paul saying many of these things about it actually being binding and upholding it and stuff. But what do you do about all the negative type passages? And so that's what we're going to cover this morning. Um, The first part of this morning is covering, well, just because Paul endorsed the law, well, how do you take these these negative passages? Now, there's two things we can do. We can, even, we can either work to figure them out for a little bit and be able to give you a summary of what they're actually standing for, or we can do what many people are starting to do, which is the most dangerous thing, and it immediately takes you from being sola scriptura to not sola scriptura. It makes even God out to be not God, and that is saying that there is biblical contradiction. And so we don't want to do that, right? We don't want to ever want to do that, and so we need to be able to take the time to be able to work these things out because there is no contradiction in God's Word because He is God, and this is God-breathed writing. This is God-breathed words, theonustos. So let's look at some of these passages. I'm going to go very quickly through some of these so that I can spend some time on why some of these passages are put into the text. Romans 6.14, I should have all these in your note handout, but if... um, If I don't, please jot them down and go back and mark them later. Romans 6.14 says this, For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. So Paul says right there, speaking, you're not under law, but you're under grace. Sounds very contradictory to what I've been saying and what Jesus and Paul has said in other passages. Romans 7.6, But now we are released from the law. 1 Corinthians 9, 20, to the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not myself being under the law, that I might win those under the law. That's a tongue twister. Galatians 2, 19, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. Ephesians 2, 15, by abolishing the law of the commandments expressed in ordinances. That last one is very key for you to understand because Paul says right there, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. That's basically the summary of the law. So what is he saying right there? Well, we also have conflict with the very words of Jesus because remember what Jesus says right before he starts speaking about the Pharisees in Matthew 5, he says, I came not to do away with the law. I came not to abolish it, not to abrogate it. He says it twice. And he says something right before he says that. He says, don't even start to ponder that I'm doing away with it. I'm not coming to do away with it, but I am coming to fulfill it. Hebrews tells us what? The book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus Christ is he's the shadow of the Old Testament law, but now we have the substance in the new covenant. Now, we don't have to look at the shadow anymore. We don't have to take that walk down the street, but it's actually the very person of Christ that is next to us. He is the substance of what the ceremonial and all the law was actually pointing to when it came to justice, when it came to the way in which we ought to live, when it came to morality, when it came to all the ceremonies and sacrifices, they were pointing to Jesus. And then... In Matthew 5, he ends up going on. He ends up actually speaking about how the Pharisees were, and we'll get to that after Christmas time and explain that even further. But at first glance, someone might try to say, this is contradictory. There's problems with this. And I'm going to read this from Theonomy and Christian Ethics, page 216 from Bonson. He says this, It might look like a contradiction, but due to the fact that Paul directly affirmed the law's holiness and goodness in Romans 7, 12, echoed Christ's words in saying that we establish the law in Romans 3.31, 1 
appeal to the law as authoritative in 1 Corinthians 9, 8 and exhorted Christians to keep the law in Galatians 5, 13, Romans 7, 12, and Romans 13 and 8. So once again, guys, we know there's no contradiction here. We just need to do a little work to understand what Paul is getting at. So in the light of these, these uh, positivity verses we have, how do we deal with these verses? How do we approach them? What do we do with them? Well, Paul, praise God, gives us an answer. Now, this is a verse that I want all of you, if you are the note taker in here, you like marking things in your Bible and stuff like I do. I know some people are like, whoa, that's whoa, sinful. Um, that's okay if you, if you hold to that. I, I love your reverence for the Word of God. Um, but if you like to mark on things or write things down, go here with me and write this verse down. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. The first letter of Timothy, chapter 1, verse 8. Paul writes to Timothy in this time frame, and he says this, Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. I'm going to read that one more time. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. What's Paul telling Timothy right here? He tells Timothy a lot. But something he's trying to get to across to what Timothy is uh, going to get out, actually out to the church is that the law is only good if you use it according to its own standard. If you use it unlawfully, then it's not done according to God's word. You'll end up distorting it. You'll end up messing it up. Things will go off the mere deep end if we don't use it the way that we should. Now, there's something that we need to point out right here in this passage is that there can be anything that we can do in life that we can take that is lawful and we can use it in an unlawful measure. We can abuse it. And that's what he's saying right here is that there's people that take the law of God and he says it's good. It's a good thing to have it. Paul and also tells us that he uh, just continues to recite from the Old Testament, the law is holy, it's righteous, it's good. We don't do away with things that are righteous and holy and good. And God tells us that in his word. And right here he says, but only if you use it lawfully. And he's saying that we can abuse anything. Let me give you two examples this morning on things that we like to abuse within the church. And sometimes teaching within the church gets us uh, way, way off into to, to, to left, uh, left field, and we don't know really how to deal with certain things. What about wine? Let's use wine as the example this morning. We can look at wine this morning, and we can say that wine is a good thing. It's a good thing. It's a good thing to drink wine at times. Jesus turned water into wine. We see in the Old Testament the people that drink wine. Paul even tells Timothy when he has certain sicknesses and ailments that he should partake in wine. He should drink it and stuff. So we don't want to look at wine or certain alcohol and just sit there and say, well, no, no, don't do, a, you know, do away with it because someone has taken it to an abusive measure. We do the exact opposite and we call out the sin, but we say, no, wine is good because God says it's good, but people still abuse it. People abuse it all the time. People go to parties, they go to different things and events and, and banquets and stuff, and they drink too much, they get in cars, they do drunk driving, they hit people, they kill people. There's many things that happen. And so it's to say that we can abuse wine. Let me give you another one that is very controversial on this day. What about the hemp plant? The hemp plant. So people can take it and they can use it as a certain drug, right? They can use it to get in a certain state. But I've heard even from, very, uh, from certain denominations, they say, man, the hemp plant, we remember when that, I've literally heard someone say this before, they said the hemp plant originated after the fall. I was like, no, God actually created the hemp plant, and whenever he looked at it after creation, he said, it's all good. All of it's good. My creation is good. It's good. But what we've done to certain things like wine and the hemp plant, we've taken and we've abused it. We've not used it for the very purpose that God has given it. The same thing goes with marriage. The same thing goes, we can even take the internet. We can take different um, things that um, you can boil it down to anything in life. 
in anything. I know many times people sit there and they'll look at people that are, you know, smoking certain things or whatnot when they're addicted to taking, you know, 15 aspirin a day. It's just to say that we can take anything and abuse it, and that's exactly what people did with the law of God. But I don't think many people understand the context. In the first century and before the first century, the abuse of the law of God was at an all-time high. It was crazy the things that they would do with God's law, how they would twist, how they would turn it. And that's why Dakota did such a great job to tell you the very traditions of the Pharisees and how they viewed parts of God's law and how they continued to add and add and add to it. They constantly abused it, and that's what Paul is saying. He's saying it is good, but it's only good if you use it lawfully. It's only good if you use it according to biblical standard. So the negative passages of the law fall, though, in three primary categories or groups. So all these that I just read to you, I'm going to go over some of them in a minute, but they fall in three primary groups. The first group is this. Paul sometimes talks with a negative measure of the law, which renounces the law as a means of justification. A means of justification. Galatians 2.19 that I just read to you guys says this. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. So remember who he is writing to when he is writing this to the, Galatia, the Galatians. He's writing this to this, this city, this town, and here are all these people that he's having to correct. And do you remember what they were doing with the law of God? They were using it as a means of justification, as a means of saying, hey, we're the Judaizers, and if you want to be in our sect, if you want to be one of us, yes, believe in the Messiah, believe in the hope, believe in everything that he has done, believe in the resurrection, praise God, hallelujah, amen. However, there's some portions of the law we're bringing in with it as means of justification. Do you remember what one of those were that Paul hammers heavy? Circumcision. Circumcision. All of you know that now because we've talked about it so many times. Circumcision, they're saying, Jesus and you got to be circumcised. Come on, Paul, you're circumcised. You were a Pharisee at one time. This, this guy who trained under many, many, but mainly primarily one very elite rabbi, you should know this. And he's saying, listen, you don't bring anything of the law over as means of justification. It's by God's grace through faith in the Messiah that you trust in of how we are justified. So right there, he renounces the law as a means of justification. It cannot justify you. Number two, the other negative uses of the law that you're going to see in the New Testament are those which point to the death-dealing nature of sin in relation to the holy law. Meaning this, Paul sometimes is telling you that the law is a schoolmaster. It is a point in which you go to to show you that you are in need for a savior. That is to instruct you, but to also show you, as James says, that if you have fallen in just one of the law, you have broken all of it, and you need a redeemer to pull you out of that because you cannot keep it. You cannot be justified by it. It's the schoolmaster. It is pointing to one that is greater, that did fulfill that law, that lived it with all the righteous commands, ordinance, and statutes, that did it perfectly, and you trust in him, in him alone, not your own working. So it points to the death-dealing nature of sin in relation to its own holy law. Number three, the last category that you're going to see the law used in a negative type is those pertaining to rabbinic traditions or ceremonial laws. I want you to look at 1 Corinthians 9.20. If you're not there, I'm going to give you a minute to turn there. 1 Corinthians 9.20. I said just a minute ago that this is one of those passages that is a tongue twister. You almost got to read it really, really slow to understand what Paul's saying. But he says, to the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law. Then he says, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. There's a lot of law in there, right? <laughs> What, Paul, what is Paul saying here? Well, Paul is telling us right here that there were times in the first century when Paul would go around that he would actually embrace and embark on a journey to doing some of these traditions 
that were given by the rabbis, that were given even at times by some of these very elite Pharisees, he would follow them, not to the point of breaking and violating the law of God, but to get in with the Jews. Now, we do this all the time on mission trips, don't we? I can tell you a couple examples. Brittany and I did this in Mexico. We did this in Brazil. I had to do this in Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, we would go in, and it was very disrespectful if you went into one of their houses and you sat down and ate and you wore your flak jacket. And the reason why is, is the Afghani people and stuff and the village elders looked at the sign of someone wearing a flak jacket saying they're still on their guard. And we don't want them on their guard. We really want them to be laid back and eat with us and enjoy tea with us. And we want it to be one more of those relaxed things. And so what we would do is we would base security, many security all around some of these houses. We would go in and we would eat with the village elders and we would take off our flak jackets. We'd keep everything really close to us. And when we would do that, they would open up about Taliban, about IEDs, 10 times more than any meeting that we ever had when it seemed that we were on our guard. And it was one of those things, what we would do is we would actually kind of, I want to say this lightly, we would disobey command to get in with them because there was a higher purpose. There was a higher purpose that we were actually able to capture Taliban. We would find all these caches of IEDs and weapons that were scattered all throughout the southern province of Afghanistan just because these village elders trusted us. That's what he's saying right here. He's saying there's things that I embarked on when it came to rabbinic ceremonial traditions that I acted as a Jew, even though he is a Jew. I went under this area of the law, this ceremonial area of tradition to become like them so that I could tell them the gospel so that I could give it to them correctly. And if you go to any mission trip overseas or any part, um, even to uh, different Indian areas out west and stuff, you'll see that often. When we were in Brazil, we went into this area that was drug lord and drug infested areas. And you're talking about some of the most heinous things that you've ever seen. You're talking about children walking around on dog, dog carcasses in the street. You're talking about children that haven't had a diaper change in eight to ten weeks. Like you're talking about some of the most disgusting filth that you've ever seen. And there were things that Brittany and I had had to do and had to kind of submit to in order to get into some of these villages by these drug cartels. And so you do it and stuff and you play their little game, but at the end of the day, what happens? The gospel advanced. And we saw many moms, we saw children come to Christ just because we played that part as if we were still in that same category. That's exactly what Paul's talking about. This is what he did. And he's showing right here the third point I was talking about, that sometimes he uses the law as an expression to say rabbinic tradition, ceremonial laws. And he's saying, I won't break them. I'm not going to break the law, but I will go under something that is unlawful in a way to be able to win them to Christ. So once again, three primary areas that Paul uses. Those which renounce the law as a means of justification, those which point to the death-dealing nature and sin in relation to the holy law, and those pertaining to the rabbinic traditions or the ceremonial laws. But please understand that Paul was neither an antinomian or a legalist, but he received much correction from God on his view of the law once he was regenerate after the road to Damascus. Now, this is my favorite part of all of it. I absolutely love this. Let's look at Paul's prior understanding of the law. Turn with me to Philippians 3.6. God saves Paul. Most of you know that story. It is a glorious story. And then some things happen that he starts to actually understand how he previously was taught when it comes to the law of God, but now how he is teaching others when it comes to the law of God. Philippians 3, 6 says this. This is Paul. As to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, I was blameless. So he says, when it came to zeal, I looked at Christians, I looked at the church, and these are people that I believed in this time were in hostility to God, blaspheming God. Sitting there saying, this isn't the Messiah. This isn't the one that we have been waiting for, the Christ. And they're going around, the Christians, and they're preaching this message of the gospel, of the good news, and everything that Jesus offers and that he gives. 
and the way that he saves and the new life that someone can have. And they're preaching about the new covenant and they're going back to Jeremiah and Ezekiel and preaching all the glory of God and the totality of scripture. But then he says something in this scripture right here. He says, as to righteousness under the law, he goes, I was blameless. Let me ask this question really quick. Was Paul under the law really righteous and considered blameless? Was he perfect in law keeping? Well, here's the thing is the text, text says he was. The text says that he was blameless. Couldn't blame him for anything. Well, how do we make sense of this? Because he's already told us in Romans 3 that none are good. None seek for God, none are righteous. All have fallen before God's glorious standard. But Paul's saying, I was good. I was righteous. I was blameless. You couldn't come to me for anything that I had done wrong. Go with me now to Galatians chapter 1. In Galatians 1, verse 14 says something that we need to hang on. He says this, And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. Paul says, All those around me, I was going above them. If they were at one standard, I was going above to the next standard. I'm this blameless man. Now here's the next thing, the key thing that you need to understand. He uses the word zeal or zealous in Philippians 3, 6 and then carries it over into Galatians 1, 14. He says, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. Remember what Dakota preached on? The traditions of the fathers of the ancestor line. So it answers it right here. Was he really blameless according to the very law that he spoke, spoke of in Philippians 3, 6? The problem is if you say it is, it contradicts the other words of Paul in Romans, Galatians, and other part. What he's saying is the very law he's speaking of in Philippians is the law of his fathers. It's the tradition. He's saying in the very rabbinic tradition I was taught, you couldn't get me on anything. I was good. I was perfect. I was holy in a sense. So here's the next question I want to ask. Paul comes to Christ. How in the world does he come to a proper understanding of God's law? How does this happen? I mean, did it, did it, just, it was just given to him in the spirit? What happened? Well, this is my favorite part of the whole thing and why I think the law of God is so valuable today and how, why we need to actually learn the law of God. Look at Galatians 2.19, just one chapter over. Paul tells us how he was corrected on his understanding of the law. And he says in 2.19, he says, For through the law I died to the law so that I might live to God. What did Paul use to correct his teaching of the law? The law. For through the law. He's saying for and through now the proper understanding of the law I died to the law, so now that I might live to God, so that I might live now to Christ. What Paul is telling us is this. If you properly understood the law, guys, you would never count in the law for your means of justification. He goes, how did I have to learn that? What did I do? It went back to actually properly understand the law. And that's times when he was even in prison and stuff at times. What is Paul asking for? He's asking for the scrolls. He's asking for the very word of God. Give me the books. Because he constantly studied them and he understood through the proper understanding of the law. I actually know now that the law actually corrected my view of Jesus. The law corrected my view of the law and showed me that I could never be justified by it. And even if you go all the way back to Genesis, right? Genesis 15, 6, how was Abraham justified? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And God says this in the midst of Abraham even sleeping, passing through all these carcasses that were cut up. Of God saying, you know how this is how I'm going to show you that I'm going to keep my promises. 
that let whatever is done to these animals and these cut up carcasses be done to me if I don't keep my command with you and my promise with you, Abraham. Now, why is that so important? Galatians 2.19, for through the law, for through the proper understanding of the law, dropping the rabbinic tradition, I died to the law so that I might live to God. It's all this to say this, and I've said it every single week since we have started this study, we need to be diligent, um, submissive, very, very good Christians, if you can say that as something that's said in the Southern Baptist way, be a good Christian and study the law of God. Study the entirety of the scripture. We're not doing what Andy Stanley says to unhitch the Old Testament. It comes as a package. It's all together. And once again, we don't get to take something that God has said is holy and continues to say is righteous and good, and we have all this New Testament revelation and just say, we'll do away with that because that's the God of the Old Testament. No, this is our standard of living. And Jesus and Paul and Peter and John and all the rest, even the brother of Jesus, James, endorses the entirety of the law. It is our very standard. That's why I can look at anyone and I can say murder is wrong. Well, how do you know? Because God says. How do you know adultery is wrong? Because God says. How do you know the correct civil penalty to put on the rapist? Well, here it is, because God says. Well, how do you know that's just, Kyle? Because God says it's just. That's how we know. Because God's a good God and he's given us a righteous standard. We ought to abide by that standard. The next thing I want to cover this morning, part two of this, this is the final part that we're going to be in this morning. Was God's law only for the nation of Israel? Was God's law only for the nation of Israel? And the answer should be no. Now, you remember me reading from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 6 through 8 this morning. I'm going to turn back to that now, and we're going to talk about it briefly. Deuteronomy chapter 6, I'm sorry, chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. One of my favorite passages in the Old Testament. And it says so many things about the law of God, but here's what it says, starting out in verse 6. He says, keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom. The law is wisdom, and it's your understanding in the sight of all the peoples, who when they hear all of these statutes, let me say it one more time, when they hear all of the statutes, does Moses say some of them? Does Moses say the ones that are relevant to the people and the society in those days? He says, no. He says, these very statutes provide wisdom and understanding that when you hear all of them, people will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I have set before you today? So Moses says the law provides wisdom. It provides understanding. And what the law was to do in the Old Testament is it was to be the very light to the other nations, to be able to draw them in to where other people would look at the law of God and they would say, what kind of God is this? that gives statutes, rules, ordinances, a law that is this good and holy and actually makes sense. No matter what way you look at it. And Israel saying, it's the one true God. It's the only God. And all you pagan nations don't even have a sense of morality because you're away from the very word of God. And so right here, they were supposed to be this light. And it's the same thing that Jesus says, that now you are the light of the world as the new covenant gives us, that the law is written on our hearts, it's written on our minds, that you're the law in a sense. You're going to actually be one guided by the Holy Spirit in the sense of being able to do the law and to obey the law. And Jesus says, don't you hide that light. You're the light on the city and the hill. Don't hide it. Don't put it under anything but you're the one that actually draws people in because they see the very way in which you live. Here's my question. If we do away with the law of God, how do the people determine now how we live? We look just like culture. 
We look just like the society around us. We look just like the other families. That's exactly what's happened to the church. And it's not to pick on any type of certain measure or certain type of sin or anything like that. But it's crazy today that people say, man, I just don't get how people aren't coming to Christ because the church is so holy. Really? The divorce rate is sometimes greater within certain states in the church than it is within the very pagan community. The sin is sometimes greater within the church when it comes to pastors and elders and leaderships and everywhere else than it is within the secular community. The one thing that you have to get back to is a standard of living, and it has to start with the family, and then it has to grow to the church, and then it has to continue to society. And it expands all the way to the very state level to where the state can sit back and say, separation of church, separation in state, but we know how to punish the evildoer, and we know how to take care of the church. We know how to take care of the person that is actually abiding by the law of God. Where does that come from? Where did that come from when the Puritans came here? It came from the biblical worldview on the principles of God's law. So he's telling us right here that the nations will see it. They will see it and they will know that there is an understanding and a wisdom that surpasses anything that they have because you are abiding by the very law that was given to Israel and the world. In Leviticus 24, God lists several laws, and then he says this in Leviticus 24, 22. You shall have the same rule for the sojourner and for the native, for I am the Lord your God. The same rule for the sojourner and for the native. I want you to turn now with me to Ezra chapter 7. Ezra chapter 7. I love in this day that Ezra is under this emperor, this king, this magistrate named Artaxerxes. How many of you have heard that name before? Someone that we would say is pretty, uh, you know, pretty famous, is talked about sometimes in, in uh, certain realms of history and different schools of thought. And you have this man, Artaxerxes. And in Ezra chapter 7, I want you to listen. This is a pagan emperor that shouldn't want anything to do with the law of God. And, you know, as much as the church today and stuff says, well, no, this is just a, uh, this is just a law given to these, these very people and everyone else was able to kind of live as, as they pleased and were able to do what they wanted to based on their own standard. Listen to what Artaxerxes asked for and tells Ezra to do. Ezra being this scribe, this actually teacher that knew the law in verses 25 and 26 of Ezra 7. 25 and 26, he says this, And you, Ezra... According to the wisdom of your God, there's that wisdom again, that is in your hand, appoint magistrates and judges who may judge all the people in the province beyond the river. All such as know the laws of your God and those who do not know them, you shall teach. Whoever will not obey the law of your God and the law of the king, let judgment be strictly executed on him whether for death or for banishment or for confiscation of his good or for imprisonment. Do you just hear what King Emperor Artaxerxes asked for? He says, Ezra, he says, establish God's law because it's the only law that gives wisdom. So he says, listen, I want you to appoint magistrates. I want you to appoint judges. And I want you to teach them in the very province of my land the word of God the law of God, all the way up to the point where he says this, and I absolutely lo love this. He says in verse 26, let judgment be strictly executed on him, on him. Someone does something that violates the word of God, that deals with death, capital punishment, he says do it strictly. That's talking about do it quickly, do it fast. Set the example to the nation. Set the example to the world. Set the example to the very empire in which I reign over. That God's law will stand. The law according to your God, Ezra. I love that. Dakota and I were talking about this before service. Isn't it amazing throughout the Bible, especially the Old Testament, 
that you always have these, you know, Christians, you have these Jews that, you know, they just, the, the kings and the emperors always ask advice from them. And then what's so funny is over time, it's like that person ends up becoming over the very king, right? Or they become like right there paralleled with them. And why does that happen so much? It's because it's actually wise. And I tell this to many people often and stuff, and this is something we need to be able to get out to the secular world, especially to our universities, is you have people in the college classroom that reject the triune God of Scripture. And what's something that happens often is they're sitting there and they're looking for wisdom. They're hungry and thirsting for intellect. But here's the problem. Without Jesus Christ as your firm foundation, there is no wisdom and there is no intellect. You fail at absolutely everything. Everything is rooted in the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. And it's amazing how that happens. And guys, this isn't to brag on me at all. And don't take it this way. But when I was growing up in school, I had a really hard time making good grades. I had a hard time concentrating. I could not stand reading. Well, later years in the Marine Corps, and then right after the Marine Corps, I just started studying the Bible a lot. I go to MTSU, and the things that I struggled with prior, years prior, I understood. Because I understood actually how to diligently work towards those things. I understood how to think. I understood the principles of God's law being applied to me today. And it's true. It's true. You want firm foundation and wisdom and logic? You want to understand how to handle the issues of the world, how to be able to handle the church, how to be able to speak to people, apologetics, philosophy, and so many different things. It starts with rooting your feet in Jesus Christ. That's what it starts with. People say, no, it can't be that simple. It's got to be something else. It's got to be some 10-step you know, method that you learn. We're talking about the God of the universe. We're talking about the God of the universe, the Holy Spirit dwelling within his people. He easily does it, and he does it all the time. But right here, even pagan emperors all throughout the Old Testament saw something about the law of God that brought so much wisdom and so much understanding and so many principles of justice to their nation that they said, Ezra, come and do this for us and come and teach the people. Man, your God's got it figured out. <laughs> Don't you wish sometimes within our society and our government that you would just have people, leaders step back and say, why don't we turn back to the God of Scripture? Pastors, elders, why don't you implement it in our land? This seems wise. This seems that it'll actually work and the people will actually be able to abide by it. We'll actually have a sense of justice now. And instead we just get, I'm, I'm not trying to be ungodly here, we just get idiotic people in office that are so separated by the Christian worldview that claim to know God and we put them in there for the very reason that they say they're a part of the Catholic Church or they say they're a part of this. And in reality, they know nothing of the law of God or how to establish it. And guess what that's gotten us? Chaos. Chaos. That's a sermon for another day, but I'll get into it later. I want to give you two accounts this morning in closing in the Old Testament that point to the fact that all of the nations were to obey the law of God. The first one is Sodom. And many of you know this story. Sodom was destroyed for its perverse sexual acts. And many, uh, of course, believe it's, it's also dealing with homosexuality there. It is so bad in Sodom when God destroys them that you have the nephew of Abraham, which is Lot. And if you remember, these two angels show up to Lot. And these people out in, in Sodom are saying, release these two men to us, Lot. Give them to us. Do you remember what they say? They say, give them to us because we want to know them. And people are like, what's so wrong with that? They just want to understand them and get to know them a little. No. They wanted to have sexual intercourse with these men. And this is men that are actually saying that. Do you remember what Lot says? This is shocking. Lot says this to them. He goes, I won't release these two men, these angels. He says, instead, I'll give you my daughters. You remember that? I'll release my daughters, and he says, which have never known any man. Can you imagine that? Living in a land so wicked, you've got two angels, and you've got your daughters, and saying, I'll release them. I'm not releasing them. Do as to them as you please, he says, but not them. 
Well, then God ends up just destroying Sodom and Gomorrah, doesn't he? But here's the thing about this, and I want you to hang on this because I'm going to tackle this in just a minute. Was the law of God, the Decalogue, given in this time period? No. It hadn't been given yet. It hadn't been given yet. But what does God do? He still implements justice and his wrath on these people for violating his very law. The next example is Nineveh. You remember what Jonah, God tells Jonah to get up and to travel to Nineveh. And I love this story because I'm going to be honest with you. Jonah, um, in a sense, um, did the exact same thing I think I would do at times. Now, one, he was either scared to death to go to Nineveh and preach, which there's sometimes I'm scared to death to go to places and preach. The second other thing that could have been happening is he didn't want them to come to repentance. And so therefore he's saying, I'd rather him be destroyed. And I know sometimes within my own heart, I'd sit there and say, I'd rather them be destroyed than come to Christ, right? If we're honest, we have many nations that do heinous, crazy actions and stuff like that. So whatever we, reason he's going, he goes to this pagan area, this pagan city, some scholars believe there was hundreds of thousands, to even to an up, up to a million people in Nineveh. But the thing is, is that they come to a state of repentance. Now, here's my question. If this pagan nation was not under the law of God, what are they repenting for? What are they repenting for? They're obviously under the law of God, just like Sodom was. And so what's so glorious about this and stuff is that actually Nineveh does come to repentance and they turn to God. But it's always to make the point right here is that they shouldn't be judged if God is actually, if it's only preserved for a certain land or a certain territory or a certain people. But instead, no, God's law went out to everyone. So here's the last question that we want to deal with. Going through all this very briefly, skimming through it this morning. Are all the people of the world really expected to uphold God's righteous standard if they do not know the Word of God? This is a difficult question. This is a question that goes out often. I want you to think about people in Papua New Guinea, okay? You have tribes in Papua New Guinea that if you do not belong to their tribe, um, sometimes they will kill you and then they will eat you or there are stories that they will eat you before you're even dead. They'll just tie you up and start to devour you. So you have people like this and people say, well, how do they know any better? I mean, how do they really know any better? They don't have the Bible there. They don't have God's law stamped up on any tree. They're not reading the Ten Commandments. And they're not listening to Jesus about love God, love neighbor. They don't have any of that stuff. So how do they actually know of how they ought to abide by? How do they know God's law? Well, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 2. Let's turn there. This is the last verse we're talk talking about this morning. Romans chapter 2, whenever you get there, go ahead and look at verses 14 and 15. Asking the question, do people know the law of God apart from actually understanding the Decalogue? Apart from actually having God's written revelation in their hand, here's what Paul says. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves even though they do not have the law. They show that the works of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. That's a powerful statement right there. Very, very powerful two verses. Paul is sitting there and he is dealing with and telling us because he knows the very question that people ask because he just finished talking about God's righteous judgment. Now he's talking about God's judgment with the law. And he says this. He says, because people are made in the imago dei, by their very nature, they have somewhat of a certain proper understanding by the very weight of their conscience, bearing that they know the law of God. <laughs> they know that they ought to not eat their neighbor, but they ought to preserve life. They know that they ought to not commit adultery, but instead they ought to be faithful. That they even witness it within just very natural theology, natural law, seeing even the way, ways in which animals even act at times and the very relationship with animals. 
looking at all the entirety of the world, he says, they know. They know. They're without excuse. So it's either going to accuse them on the day of judgment or it's going to excuse them, but they understand it. So in a sense, when every, every person is born, being in, made in the image of God, the law is written on their hearts. So some of you are probably asking, what's the difference then of the new covenant? Well, here's the difference. Now within the new covenant, the Holy Spirit is given to us. He indwells with inside of us to help us, guide us, and sanctify us to inwardly keep his law. It's a whole lot better now, right? Instead of just be written on stones of tablet. Now the Holy Spirit actually sanctifies us in accordance to his law to where our mindset now is even thinking about it. But don't start to come up with the excuse that the person in Papua New Guinea should not be judged by God because they don't have the actual Bible staring them in the face. Paul says, no. He says the exact opposite. By the very nature of them being made as the Imago Dei, they know the law of God. They know the things that what they are doing is wrong. It bears weight on them when they do it within their conscience. And you can even go all the way and listen to interviews to people like Jeffrey Dahmer, a man that murdered many different other men, had sexual relationships with these men even after they were deceased and he killed them, would carry parts of his, their bodies to the chocolate factory of which he worked and sits back in prison and says, the whole time I knew that it was wrong and then later admits that he knew it violated the very standard of God. And whether you believe he came to Christ or not, he says he did. But just to say this, even someone like Jeffrey Dahmer admits later on that in the midst of all that was going on, he says he couldn't stop it because he was living in the flesh, and instead he should have been in living in accordance with the Spirit, and the Spirit lives in accordance with the law of God. He did the exact opposite. Please do not be fooled, church, into thinking that God's law is only binding for a specific tribe or is constrained to a border or geographical location. That's what our nation has done. That's why we have sayings like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. And my saying is what happens in Vegas falls underneath the wrath of God. You just got away with it. Morality is not legislated and does not depend in a line drawn in the sand. It is no different if I travel to Kentucky, Indiana, to California, Canada, Mexico, Brazil, Afghanistan. Morality doesn't change because I cross landscape. Morality doesn't change because someone is a Mexican and here am I. It's not tribalism. It doesn't depend on the location, and God does not have a double standard for what is morality. He has one standard, and he knows, because it is in his written word and his revelation that all men should walk and live in accordance to it, and those that do not will be judged. If that does anything to you, it should actually point to you how much the gospel needs to get out. Instead of looking back and saying the person in Papua New Guinea doesn't know any better and God will be lighter on them in the day of judgment and accept them into the kingdom because they didn't know the word of Jesus. Instead, it should cause us to be hungry and thirsty to actually get the gospel out to the very people because by their very conscience, they know they have violated the standard of God. Therefore, they will be judged. Don't use that as an excuse, church. And please know that it doesn't matter the tribe, it doesn't matter the border, it doesn't matter the geographical location. God's word is binding everywhere. And if you don't believe me, I just please ask you to continue to study the law of God because the same theology that was passed on in Greg Bonson's day, in Rush Dooney's day, in Gary North's day, and even in our day is the same thing that's going on of this antinomian approach to the law that says we will live in accordance to how we want to live. There is no standard above us. And what you do is you look at God and you say, screw God right to his face when you violate his very standard. Once again, I've said this in closing every week, let's get back to studying the law of God and the complete word of God so we can live according to his standard. Let's pray this morning and we'll open up for a few questions. Lord God, I thank you so much for this day. 
I thank you so much for your word, God. I thank you for your law, God. I thank you, God, for just all of your times where you just help me to even understand your law. God, I pray that we would continue to study in it as a church. And God, not, not just your law, God, but, but all areas of scripture, God, whether it's dealing with salvation, whether it's dealing with eschatology, God, whether it's dealing with creation, whatever it's dealing with, God, that we would know your word better, Lord. God, we thank you for all that you continue to do for us, God. And I thank you for these people here in this room that have the hearts, they have the minds, they have the mindset and the ears and the eyes to see and to listen, and to be challenged just like I've been challenged by your very word. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name.